Wendy Fixman. And I'm Natasha Gargiulo. Welcome to 20 to Life. We're here at the Pizza Delic on Monklin in Montreal and we've been chatting about Generation Labels and we both agree that Generation X is just one of the worst. The label undermines how many people in their 20s really live. Our lives don't revolve around going to clubs and playing pool. Most of us were brought up aware of unemployment, a recession, out of control pollution, and a province torn between separating and remaining in Canada. Many of us in our 20s have been raised with the sobering reality that after we get our bachelor's degree, it's not a coupon redeemable for a job in our field. We may be unemployed for months after graduation. It's this honest view of the world which drives us to be concerned with serious issues. We try to get involved with groups who are at least attempting to change what we've seen so far in life. Most of tomorrow's leaders are already making waves in school, getting in touch with the problems over the price of higher education in Canada. Students are studying for midterm exams now, but many international and out-of-province students are busier circulating their transcripts. The Quebec government's recently proposed fee hikes on tuition may force these students to seek post-secondary institutions elsewhere. This move could drastically reduce university's greatest resources, its students. We have more in this report. Each year, over 1,000 international students come to study at Concordia. Besides injecting millions of dollars into the economy annually, they bring a vibrant cultural diversity to the university community. But due to a recent government hike in international student fees, the question as to whether Concordia will continue to attract international students remains unclear. Already, international students pay on average about four times higher tuition fees than Quebec residents. In other words, the student must pay the full price of their education without any assistance from the provincial government. In fact, all extra student differential fees go directly to the Quebec government and not to the university. This is one of the biggest differences between the Ontario international fee system, which serves as the Quebec model, and our own university system. In 1995, Ontario deregulated the entire international student fee system, allowing the universities to both set their own prices for international students and keep all revenues. Revenues which go directly towards improving the quality of student life and revenues which universities like cash-strapped Concordia just don't have. But still, for me, it's, it's a drop in the bucket. It's no long-term solution. It's really short-sighted. And let's face it, it, is not, it doesn't bring a, a strong solution for our problems in education. Claudette Fortier is the director of the International Students' Office at Concordia University. Many said that their parents had invested all their savings. You know, we often think, or, or, or I often think that the general public thinks that international students all come from millionaire families. Um, this is not the case. Contrary to popular belief, oh Quebec's international yes. students do not pay yeah. over the lowest rates oh. in the country. Previously second to Ontario, these new hikes of about 15% bring Quebec on par with many universities in Ontario, and in some cases, even higher. It also brings Quebec to have some of the most expensive universities for international students in the country. How did you feel when you first heard the news that the uh, hike would come? I was very scared. Um, I was very scared because I'd already budgeted for the next three years with, with a slight increase in fees that I was expecting each year. I mean, that's obvious. Um, I was scared, yeah. But early media reports assured people that a high number of government exemptions would allow international students to attend schools without paying the higher fees. This, says Fortier, is not completely accurate. When the, in, in the letter from the minister, uh, from the minister it is mentioned that um, it is not such a, or it will not have such a serious impact because 55% of students, international students, are exempted. The letter, or the minister, forgot to say that, yes, these statistics are true for Francophone universities. At Concordia, I've calculated if I uh, don't count exchange students, but count students registered in regular programs, 76 percent of our students pay differential fees. Can you afford to stay at Concordia? Um, I have to find a way. Um, I have to find a way because 
I already put so much effort, you know, like four years of hard work to get to film school, so I'll have to find a way. In Ontario, educators say that high prices dramatically reduce the number of international students attending their universities. Their solution? Drop the prices on some academic programs. In Quebec, this looks unlikely, and the enrollment for international students in 1997 remains to be seen. This is Alison Lappert reporting for 20 to Life. Now we've been asking around, and the consensus is that all of us have raised money for charity at some point in our lives. I remember during Halloween, I helped out UNICEF by wearing those little boxes tied around my neck, and I also canvassed for the disabled children by uh, selling those little blue pins. I had to sell uh, taco bars to raise money for a school trip, but I went around my neighborhood and no one bought any of the taco bars, so my dad had to buy the whole box. I would have much preferred to raise money like the Becca players do on the West Island. I mean. At least I don't have to go knocking on doors. Yeah, because they put on a show to raise money for, with their ticket sales. Personally, I'd rather be entertained than approach with high calorie snacks. If you would like a more entertaining way to give to charity, then our next story will greatly interest you. Montreal's very own Beckett players are at it again with their annual Way Off Broadway show to help raise funds for research into children's diseases. To date, the Beckett players have raised $2.5 million for the St. Justin Hospital, the Montreal Children's Hospital, and the needy children around the world. Curtains up on the Beckett players and let the show begin. Okay, Mark, can we do prayer? Okay. It's called Help Me to Remember. Please, God, help me to remember, at least help me to try to see and feel a mother's pain when a newborn babe won't cry. Help me to remember the child who's been forgot, the joys and smiles. He may never see the things he won't be taught. Lord, help me to remember the child who's all alone, whose cries at night are unanswered, the child who has no home. Help me to remember the reason we're all here is not for our own achievements, but for the child whom no one hears. Please help me to remember the child who cannot play, who's too sick and weak and tired, the one who's lost his way. Help me to remember the child whose stomach's not full, to be unselfish, caring, and giving, kind, and warm, and gentle. So, God, with this I pray thee for the children I haven't met, to help me to remember for those who can't forget. May 1995, Tracy Griffith. I think that Beckett um, finds something in people and helps them develop it. If I have five minutes of time um, left in my day, Beckett will get ten. It certainly is a, a really positive experience for me um, to practice what I've spent the last perhaps uh, 18 years developing a, a, a musical talent, and I actually get to express it in with uh, you know really professional people like this. It's wonderful. Beckett is just, uh, it's one of the most wonderful organizations we've ever been a part of because you actually see some of the results of the things that you do. You know the kids really get the money and the organizations get it and it's just an excellent organization. I'm very, very proud to be a part of it. Five, six, seven, and slide, two, three, four, five, six, one, seven, eight. We've both been a part of Beckett for over six years now. We started as dancers in the show and for the last five years or so we've been choreographers for the show. I just think they're my second family. Basically, that's the way I yep. look at them, you know? So I just think that Beckett is the best. I really do. It's addictive. It is. <laughs> I'm doing Beckett because it's a chance to work with some very fine people and hopefully a stepping stone into the world of performing arts. Uh, I saw it last year and I said, I can do that. So here I am. <laughs> Hi, this is my second year with Beckett. This is Stephanie. Say hi. 
Hi. And she comes with me every time we have a rehearsal. She has a blast. And we have a lot of fun doing this. Sometimes you'll see her do some stuff. She's quite funny. When I was hospitalized, a nurse came into, the, into my room and said to me, would you mind getting your picture taken? And I laughed and I said, why would that be? And she said, well, this machine that you're attached to is donated by the Beckett Players. And I, I couldn't believe that. It touched home. It gave me life. And I know it gives other people life. And that's the motivating factor for me, knowing that it's helping other people. Media concentration. Media is a fourth estate. Media ownership levels in a democratic society. Confused? That's the way the heads of the media conglomerates would like you to be. Issues surrounding freedom of the press are still important today. But reporters may not be fighting the outside world so much as they are fighting with the owners of the newspapers or television networks. The con concentration in ownership results in dozens of newspapers across Canada being extremely similar. Financial interests cause the public to lose out on quality journalism. Here's communications studies student Colin Fisher with his opinion on the business of news coverage. The media today occupies an ever-increasing part of our psyche. Not only of the individual, but also of the psyche of the society within which it operates. It is easy for us to look to other countries in the world that has a controlled press and see the effects that it has on the free flow of information. To our Western mind, we equate a free press with a people able to freely express themselves. Moreover, our democratic ways are reliant on a free press. We turn to the media to seek information and guidance on the most pressing issues that surround us each and every day. But what is this media which informs and guides us? Who makes the decisions about what is or isn't to be printed or broadcast? What are the underlying principles and motives that guide their decision making? Does the media itself realize the importance that they play in the democratic equation? And do they care? The reality is that yes, the media does realize the importance and influence they have in directing the dialogue in a democratic society. They then sell this power and influence in 30 second bundles and fractions of a page to advertisers. The power and influence that the media has is merely a commodity to be sold. Should something such as the media, which is so integrally linked with the health of a democratic society and the free flow of balanced and meaningful debate, be governed merely by the profit motive? With mainstream media being primarily concerned with selling advertising and profit margins, the concern is that only programmers and articles that will attract advertisers will be printed or broadcast. In addition, anything that is critical of any advertisers will be quickly dropped for fear of losing their advertising dollars. Large conglomerates are at the mercy of advertisers even more so than small independent media outlets. Consider this, a large conglomerate owns a few magazines, a book publisher, a newspaper chain and a few television stations. The book publisher prints something that offends advertisers who advertise in their magazines and newspaper chain. The advertisers call up the parent company and tell them that if the offending book is published, they will pull all of their advertising in the magazine and the newspaper. This would amount to a loss of millions for the parent company. The result, the book won't be published and the public will remain ignorant of a subject that concerns them. Were the publishers to have been independent, the advertisers would have had them no means to prevent the book from being published. Unfortunately, this type of occurrence happens more often than we would care to think. To ensure a free and open media, large conglomerates should be divested to ensure that many different voices are present in the public debate that is the very essence of a democratic society. With concentrated media ownership, only a few voices will be clearly heard. The media is not merely business, it is a public trust that is there to inform the public of the myriad of issues that surround them each and every day. The idea that there are fewer and fewer owners of the mainstream media calls into question the public ability to be adequately and justly informed something which is essential to a healthy democracy. And now Colin Fisher joins us here with MJ Malloy, the Quebec coordinator for the Canadian University Press for a discussion on media monopoly. In light of the increase in concentration levels of the media, do you feel that the media is still a public trust or is it just being run like a business? 
Well, I think you're right in that there is certainly greater control. There are less and less people learning more and more of, the, of what we read on a daily basis. But I think we have to go back in history and, and, and realize that that's always been the case. Newspapers have always, in this country, been corporate entities owned by people who, at the end of the day, are, are business people, um, who have rarely failed to use these, these papers to support their, their friends in high office and the things that they feel are important. So certainly I think we have to be concerned about what's happening now with media monopolies, but I think we also have to realize it's always been the case in, in Canada. Yeah, but it sounds like you're saying that it was bad then and it's bad now. But the problem you're getting now is you're having with these large conglomerates is that you're getting, you know, there's a cross ownership of media. So you'll have mm -hmm. one so their own stuff. newspaper, their own radio, they're also on TV. And the thing is, what's happening now is that the, the media is losing its critical focus because it has to pander to advertising. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think I agree with you. But I asked a very similar question to James Winter, who's a media critic and, and very critical of, of corporate control of the media. And he talked about how um, Hollinger Corporation just bought a controlling interest in Southern, and a lot of people felt, felt that this was sort of the death knell of the free press. But he said, look, you know, now we obviously have uh, owning all the papers in Canada as opposed to four capitalists. You know, where is the difference? Um, and certainly we have to be con concerned about the effect on, on, on the press in Canada about, by that sort of corporate control. But what I'm arguing is that is that corporations have always controlled what we read. And I think what's more important is to look at the, the um, viewpoint and the background and the culture that reporters and journalists come from and how that affects what they write and what, and what they print. Um, what about independent newspapers, radio and television stations? How do they survive in this environment? Where do they fit in? I think it's, it's a time of, to use a cliche, sort of great danger and great opportunity. I mean, the, uh, from my experience, the advertisers are less and less willing to sort of support things that are, that are radical or outspoken. Um, but at the same time, I think most mainstream media is getting more and more boring, less and less accessible, especially to people our age. You know, I think if you polled people in this room, very few of them would say they read a paper every day you know, or, or every week even. And I think there really is an opportunity out there for, for new newspapers who are much more accessible, more exciting. Um, much less stodgy, have these alternative viewpoints to really, to really fit in, to really succeed, to sort of shake up the Global Mail, shake up these places. So I think it's, I guess it's you know a time of great uncertainty for these kind of these kind of people. On that note, I want to thank you both for coming, Colin and MJ. Um, it's been a very interesting conversation, and thank you again. And now we turn to the art corner, where we ask the question: Is graffiti an art form? What do you think? Well, I definitely see the art value in this kind of work, but there is a stereotype associated with the type of person who does this. Yeah, we tend to associate them with being gay in society and artists who don't respect the city's desire to have clean buildings or bridges. Well, this issue merits further investigating, so we went out on the streets of Montreal for an answer. Graffiti is defined as a crude inscription or drawing on a wall or other public surface. But one must ask the question, is this the true definition of the word or simply society's take on what graffiti should mean? To find out what you think, we took to the streets to ask some local Montrealers their opinions on graffiti. What do I think of graffiti? Well, I think it's an art form and I think it can be exciting and interesting. Uh, it should be colourful and it should be developed, it shouldn't just be scrawl on the walls. Uh, I guess in a way it's a form of art. The only time I really hate it is when it like it damages somebody else's property. Like if it's on an empty building and nothing's and it's falling apart, and then they're hey they're doing something for it. Dara McIntosh and Dina Pino are two third-year communication studies students at Concordia who decided to tackle the subject of Montreal graffiti. Okay, so what, made you what made you decide to do a topic like graffiti art to do your TV3 documentary project? Well, um. Since I'm interested and involved in the hip-hop culture, I find that gravi graffiti is um, a big part of hip-hop. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of explore the two and maybe how they came about. And also I found that I really didn't know that much about graffiti. I noticed it always in the city and I, I've either admired it or not admired it and I wanted to know more about it. So I thought this was a good opportunity and I thought it would be a really cool documentary and really fun to work with. What were some of the interesting aspects you learned about graffiti while doing the documentary? It's like an underground community. Definitely heavily linked uh, with the uh, hip-hop culture. Dara and Dina further expressed how there are many misconceptions where graffiti is concerned. The terminology um, 
to me, graffiti is graffiti, but I found out that certain things like tags, mm -hmm. throw ups, um, throw ups is something, it takes more time and the tag is just like the name. I used to call it, you know, the scribble, <laughs> but it's not a scribble, it's actually the name of the person. And I, I cleared up a lot of misconceptions, as I said. I sort of thought that um, yeah. graffiti was just like maybe inner city thing, but there's people from all walks of life, and a lot of them are very educated, you know, and they take a lot of time in doing their work. The, like the production is pre-production actually, where you sit there with your notebook and you design something, and then you go out and you do it. And I always thought, well, maybe you had flashlights and stuff, but a lot of these guys are doing it in the dark. In the dark yeah. yeah, which really surprised me because uh -huh. the stuff I saw, it's incredible. There's a lot behind graffiti that people don't know about. The work that goes into it and the time, it's unbelievable. We found out we knew nothing about graffiti. <laughs> we knew nothing. And <clears throat> there was a whole culture to learn about. To wrap up the interview, we asked them both their opinion of graffiti. After the documentary, I'm even more confused of what graffiti is. Yes, it's art, and no, it's not art. Okay. Um, depends what kind of graffiti you're looking at, and then it depends what context you're looking at it. It's beautiful art, that's what it is. Natasha, what would be your dream vacation? Well, I always want to go someplace really hot and tropical like Hawaii or Jamaica. I agree, warm climates are amazing, but with airfare and hotel and an, a few souvenirs, it gets so expensive. Well, what's the least expensive trip you've ever been on? Um, well, my friends and I drove to Quebec City and we stayed at this little hotel. We had the best time. Oh my God, I think a trip in February is an ultimate tension reliever. Definitely. You need that extra boost in the middle of February to keep you going till spring. Well, we'd obviously travel a lot more if we had more money. Yeah, but sometimes a few dollars is just enough to have a good time. There are several places off the island of Montreal that give you a change of pace without leaving you broke. Watch this next piece and see the price of adventure. Hi. There are many ways to get to Val David. One of them is hitchhiking. However, I remember to dress warmly, especially when it's minus 40. Need a lift? Yes, please. Where are you going? All right, so are we. Let's go. Hitchhiking is a great way to meet people, but not everyone's style. For some, the bus from Barrie is the best option at $11. Before heading out for some winter fun, I'm going to grab bites to eat with my new friends. Let's go. Breakfast is, after all, the most important meal of the day. Wherever you go, don't forget to check out your local tourist office. In Val David, you can find out about ice picking, mountain climbing, skiing, and snowboarding. When you're outdoors, it's important to note that you've got to dress warmly, especially if you're going on a sleigh ride. In Val David, however, they do provide you with blankets. Nice pan, eh? <laughs> Just I, this is a perfect time to start tasting. Oh, hold on. This is wicked. Okay, the sun's gone. Perfect. Besides snowshoeing, Val David is well known for its 122 kilometers of cross-country track set. But that doesn't mean that you can't just play in the snow. Seven kilometers north of Val David lies Saint Agathe, or more important, the location of the superb ice castle. On the shores of Lac de Sable, anyone can slide on crazy carpets, and all skill levels of skaters, from professionals to beginners, can skate. Just be careful out there and mind the ruts! For a fantastic place to stay, try the Chalet Beaumont, a youth hostel international, where you can get prices for as low as $20 per room. Let's go inside. What a view! Panoramic! and a fully equipped kitchen where you can cook your own meals. We had salmon. A cozy dining area is provided. But make sure you bring enough wine. 
Finish your evening in front of the fire. The perfect ending for a fun-filled day. Good night from Val David. That's it for us. Thanks to Pizza Del Comandle in Montreal for their cooperation. We hope you like the show and have a new perspective on us, Generation X. today. We've got a bit of a different show for you this week. The graduate students from the journalism department have been out and about collecting stories about some of Concordia's more extraordinary students. Anna, you spent the day with some students who are acting up. Yes, and I'll be kicking the show off with the whole pool of acting talent from Concordia. They've put together a play, Anne Devlin's After Easter. It's an Irish production and uh, it's a Canadian premiere and I hung around during rehearsals. And I understand, Murphy, you'll be wrapping the show up? I'll be wrapping this show up with a story about Concordia's international students. We spent the day sugaring off, and I had no idea that's where maple syrup came from. But in between all of that, we've got witches, single moms, musicians, and Concordia's oldest student. But Anna, your piece is coming up now. Oh, great. See you later. Let him go. Don't rock the lives of your children on his account. Your family love you, and I know you love that man. Don't break up your little family of pride. I'm saying this for me too, Greta. I wish I had a family. I wish I had children. I wish I had everything. Anne Devlin's After Easter play is a struggling quest for strong family ties in a torn apart Ireland. Greta, played by Lisa Vindicious, is the symbol of that quest. Just what I've been trying to tell you. Sometimes when I can't decide what to do, I get angry and find I've already acted. My anger makes the decision for me. Greta is 
lo has lost herself, lost her soul, lost everything, and she comes back to find herself and uh, come together with her family who have all been separated and, and our father has just died so we all reunite and discover a lot of things about ourselves. The discovery of hidden emotions played a big part in the play. So there's always a lot of tension in the family and you know people die, people get a little hysterical at funerals, you know, people, people get a little crazy. Only his wife, only his wife, what do you say? Where is his blood love? Not you. Eva, blood love is stronger. I'm your mother. Much of that either. Oh, but stop it! You're a father, mother, and a father to me. Come on, let's get her out of here now. No. Have you never loved your daughter until you hated us? Every last one of us. You only loved your son. You tried to turn our father against us. Eva, stop it! You're killing your mother. That's true. Don't tell me that. 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 Don't and, uh, I mean, there aren't really very many men in the play at all. <laughs> the production of After Easter involved a great deal of research. Theater student and dramaturg Bridget Gillen really plunged in and discovered a passion for Ireland. The more that I read about the politics that was going on and just the stuff that goes on every day in Northern Ireland, I was shocked. And I truly felt compelled that I had to find out more and I had to work on this play. And even now, like, even though the play is going to be over, I don't think it's going to stop. Like, I feel like I have to read more. All the actors in the play have also done their own personal research. There's a lot of pictures up in my dressing room and stuff of, like, people in Ireland and, like, what life is like that, of the landscape, all that stuff, reading about the history, reading about the politics, all that stuff really helps put you there. Don't write me more in soon. You know, this table isn't as solid as it looks. There's light passing through it all the time, only we can't see it. Who told you that? I met a lovely man on the first day of university. The accent really helps because it sort of puts you there and, uh, and it really transforms you because it's not your voice anymore, it's somebody else's voice. So the accent really helped. Can and you do it once, just say a line with the accent? I'll do you uh, Greta's favorite line. Uh, Don't be so practical! <laughs> Lisa, Amy, and the others have been working on their accents for months now, and the expert on Ireland is happy with the results. Okay, thanks. All good, Anna exquisite, and compelling. Today. That's how I would describe this play. Okay, great. <laughs> Anna Denishevsky for Concordia Today. And now for a totally different story. Caroline de Rosière found out about a service at Concordia for students with disabilities. The service helps these students get around just like everybody else. I tell you, in my last semester, six courses, it's, uh, I can't wait till it's over. <laughs> I can't wait till it's until over. Until graduation time. Until, until I can walk across that stage on June 13th. <laughs> and then I, I'll know that, you know, it's been worth it. Janice Asuncion, a blind student at Concordia University, is graduating in a couple of weeks from now. But that wouldn't have been possible without the enormous support given by the service for disabled students. Their mission is to help the students who are disabled with services that ensure their academic integration. Leo Bissonnette, coordinator of the service, is blind himself and understands students' needs. In terms of their academic life here at Concordia, the student coming in here with the objective of obtaining their degree or diploma is given the, the practical assistance that they need to make that possible. Computer is a very important tool for students with a blind impair. Leo uses that technology thanks to a braille keyboard underneath his laptop. So by these navigational keys, I can read what's on the, on the screen. Second step is to print, in braille of course. Final stage is to read by touching the paper. But some students with other disabilities need different services. And our services become very concrete services in that we work with a student based on the particular profile that he or she presents. Because of her small stature, Mary saint Hilaire seeks a different kind of help at the service for disabled students. Although thanks to her dog, Mary is nearly 100% independent, she still needs the service. They also relocated some classes um, so that it would be like easier for me to get to because originally I was at the Loyola campus so they moved some classes like all in the same building so I wouldn't have to go outside. But some students need to go from one campus to another. Efforts were made to make the shuttle bus wholly accessible to all students. Well in terms of transportation uh, our fleet of shuttle buses are wheelchair accessible because students in general have to take courses to, on both campuses. 
or there are activities at both campuses that may be of interest to a student. Although students with a mobility problem can access both campuses, there are still some places at Concordia that need easier access. The issues around inaccessible space really focus around a lot of buildings down here. If you walk up Mackay, there are a lot of annex buildings that are not accessible. These little obstacles didn't prevent Mary or Jennison to have a student life just like any other. That's an important thing to tell people. For, for me in particular, I'm just like every other student. You know. For Concordia Today, I'm Caroline de Rosière. These are just a few of the Concordia students who are overcoming challenges. Phoebe Day met up with one student who doesn't let anything get him down. Sound ready? Camera ready? Speed. Roll camera, roll sound, action. Mike Gutwillig is hard at work. He wrote and directed a play called Closers for School. Yes, school. At the age of 70, Mike returned to Concordia to study cinema. What I like to do basically is tell a story. And uh, you know, the only reason I'm there is I want to learn the process. So uh, if I can't sell screenplays, I'll, I'll go out and get them produced. Years ago, he wrote a musical called The Special. It was adapted for the stage in New York and received much critical acclaim. And to support his passion, Mike has worked as a real estate agent for 25 years. Mike is a human kind of person, which is interesting because it brings a different dimension to the real estate. Well, you know, you got to take hats off to Mike. I mean, here he is, he's 72 years old. Uh, the desire to go back to school, I think, is really extraordinary. It says a lot about him. And he's been able to, uh, to, to balance both of them. Recently, Mike faced yet another challenge. He fell in his apartment and broke his ankle. He's missed a few days of classes, but in typical Mike fashion, he'll finish his school year as planned. His teachers and classmates aren't surprised by his perseverance. Of course he's going to continue. He's full of, uh, of uh, energy and he's, uh, he really wants to do films. Because of his age, uh, he's like a, f a father uh, type of person. Uh, he cares about the, you know, the other more young students. Mike is the kind of guy who doesn't let anything get in his way and he's very determined to do what he wants to do. He's always on the go. He's not just in class, but even otherwise, he's always writing, and you know, he's done a lot of stuff outside school as well. Mike didn't have a portfolio to submit to the university, so he put together a history of his life. My, my transcript, they actually had it at Sir George. From the period I was there was from 1942 to 1948, interrupted by war service. In 1990, Basically, Mike discovered he had prostate cancer. And often, um, the person who has cancer is a sensitive person who's busy looking after everybody else but ignoring their own needs, and who hasn't gone for their magic song, you know, for the real thing they want to do in their life. And the only thing I've ever wanted to do is write. And I'm always postponing these things, you know, putting them off. So then I, I began taking the attitude of, you know, with the time left, what is it I want to do? Alien. Mike's wife, Judy, yeah, talks about her alien. husband's determination. <laughs> because, I don't know any, anybody else, you know, <laughs> on this earth that's uh, as, uh, dedicated to what he wants to do, and he'll do it. Even if he was 100 years old, he would do it, you know. Everybody likes Mike, and why shouldn't they? He's an extraordinary man. For Concordia Today, I'm Phoebe Day. Within Concordia's diverse population, there are many students who face special circumstances. Travis Todd had the opportunity to catch up with one student who has a special circumstance of her own. It's like every morning we're just rushing, rushing, rushing all the time. That's all right. Rushing all the time is a round-the-clock reality for Tatiana Adante, a full-time single mom and university student, and the days start early. Sometimes I'll, on the weekends, I'll get him in bed with me at 6.30 and, and I'll try and get him to sleep a little bit more, but usually ends up being, he wakes up and he goes and grabs his toys and brings them to me in the bed and, and, and he wakes me up anyway, so. Two and a half year old Adrian devotes his attention to the television while mom watches over the time. Tatiana gets them through breakfast with a little persistence and a lot of patience. It's a routine, exactly. It's, um, I don't, I don't find I don't find it complicated. It's it's, it's okay. I mean, it, I'm I'm sure I'm more rushed than other people, but 
but that's okay. I mean, I'll, I'll get him at daycare on time and I'll be in class on time and then I'll be able to relax. Tatiana decided to go back to school this year after Adrian turned two. She is completing her bachelor's in communication. She is raising Adrian on her own with support from her parents. Daycare is just a part of the daily routine for the young family. Government assistance makes it possible to meet the financial challenges of returning to university. So I do go to school and I am a good parent, but I am on loans and bursaries. And um, they, um, they, they, they give me money. Um, it's not a great deal of money. I still am on a pretty tight budget, but at least it, 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 uh, it permits me to, to go back to school. The most important thing I want to, to teach Adrian is, is I, I want to go to work and I want to love my work. I want to be passionate about my work. I want him to learn that. I don't want to be stuck in a 9-to-5 job that I hate. I don't want him having to come home from school and, and hearing his mother you know, complaining about the work day or um, how boring it is and, and how life has passed by and she kind of got stuck you know, in the same position. It's not easy. You know, it, it's, not, it's not for everyone. <laughs> Um, God knows there'd be some times where, you know, I, I, I just don't know where to look anymore because my bills are due, my term papers are due, my child is sick and, and, and things are just upside down and I've got to, you know, find someone I can lean on. It's not easy, but I think if you want something badly enough, you make it work. And, and I am making it work. I want to make it work. Travis Todd, Concordia Today. And now, from our single mom to a multi-musical phenomenon, Derek Marinos profiles Diane White. She's a Concordia student who hits all the high notes. Diane White is a talented singer, songwriter, and musician who is studying music here at Concordia. She was gracious enough to allow our cameras to follow around last week, from jazz improv class to a big band rehearsal. So, here is a unique look at a week in the life of Diane White. Music is a way of life for White. She devotes countless hours fine-tuning her craft. On Tuesday, she got together with fellow music students for a little trombone jam session. Under the guidance of jazz professor Charles Ellison, White hones her vocal skills at the jazz improv class. Enjoy. say Diane White's name and um, I smile. Uh, there's a feeling of warmth. There's a feeling of, uh, of, of enormous uh, respect. There is the promise of greatness uh, in terms of Diane. Walk down the street and you'll see the many faces. Faces. Faces are walking and seldom show us places. Faces. Look at the footprints, you'll never see the person standing by.
hope you enjoyed our look at Diane White, an emerging artist here at Concordia. And now with a look at another artist, here's Lisa Dinocenzo. Stephen Sparling doesn't believe in boundaries. I often think, I think of it in terms of flying. You know, it's like Icarus with his wings. And when he takes flight, I mean, you're defying a what, what mankind is supposed to be able to do. You're challenging the gods. You're saying, I'm going to sing this music or I'm going to dance. It's like when you light up new matches, or new match, you say, for Stephen. I produce a great musical and poetical fire. Pain is pain and happiness is happiness and, and I have my own experiences and I use those. It's not even consciously, you know, think back to the time I was age, but it's just there, the text, you know, ich komme vom Gebirge her, blah, 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 as I go through that, it, it connects with my own memories of, of being an outsider. When I was younger, it was much more difficult because I, I was a dancer too, and I took ballet and piano, and, and yeah, I grew up in small towns in Alberta, so it's not really established gender roles for, for young boys to, to pursue those kinds of activities. In this dance, Stephen addresses the issue of gender stereotypes. I was, I was intrigued by the questions that these people were asking themselves. One of them, Kate Bornstein, that's the one, she was a, she used to be a he, she was a, a transsexual lesbian performance artist and uh, wrote a book called Men, Women and the Rest of Us, a look at gender, gender issues. And uh, I thought it was really interesting when she discussed the, the fight that she had to go through to, to find a space in the world. Stephen hopes to find his space on the uproptic stage. Like, you know, it's like wanting to play football in the NFL or, you know, I mean, lots of people want to do that, but, but to actually succeed and to make it. Stevens works with the termination of somebody who cannot live without singing. And then when you finally come to the performance, it's so rewarding and such a relief because, you know, there's been so many hours and weeks and whatever pr preparing for that one moment. For Concordia Today, I'm Lisa Dino Sanzo. While Stephen is busy challenging the gods, some Concordia students are worshipping them. Andrea Howick talks to members of the Pagan Society. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? <laughs> Since Shakespeare's day and even before, witches have been getting a bad rap. But what about these people? Do they look like witches to you? Well, some of them are. They're part of Concordia University's Pagan Society. Its offices are at the Loyola campus. This woman, 22-year-old Monique Cantors, is the president, although she does not yet consider herself a witch. I don't know if I call myself a witch. I, I would like to, but I'm not trained. I don't have that kind of training. The society's aim is to demystify paganism. The role of the Pagan Society is, first of all, to educate people as to what paganism is, to answer any questions they might have about paganism, and to demystify it, because there are a lot of mysteries around it. Paganism is not just witchcraft. It refers to many religions. There is Druidism, Nordic Druidism, Celtic Druidism. Um, you go into more towards the African traditions. You have Vudan, uh, Cantoble, Satyria. Um, Native American shamanism is also considered paganism. Linda Demissi is a druid. She leads the group in a bardic circle, one of the society's many events. They would, that's how, one of the ways that which culture was, was transmitted. You'd have the wandering bards uh, bring stories, songs from village to village, and uh, bring all the gossip too. One of the many things we don't know about witches and witchcraft is, do male witches exist? Meet Ralph Osborne. The 25-year-old is in charge of PR for the Pagan Society. Um, well, I am a witch. Raised Catholic, Osborne first became interested in witchcraft at 13. Witchcraft was the way for me 
that, you know, what is right is right, no matter what anybody thinks. But some people do care what others think. Students in Witchcraft 101, not for credit, asked not to be shown on camera. Cantors will complete her degree in English Lit this year. At the same time, her term as president will end. She would like to see some ideas change. Don't believe everything you see in the movies. <laughs> Even the bard had a hand in the reputation witches have today. Don't make too swift judgments based on what you already know. <laughs> For Concordia Today, I'm Andrea Howick. We've tried to show you the diversity of Concordia University, but if you're not convinced yet, we have one last report for you. Students come from all over the world to study at Concordia, and Murphy Cobbing went along when the International Student Society organized a very Canadian activity for them. There really is only one way to travel when you are on the way to taste one of Quebec's greatest delicacies. A group of Concordia's international students swapped their usual classes in the city for a lesson in the art of sugaring off in the woods of Rougemont. Concordia's International Students Office organizes events from apple picking to ski trips, so students from the four corners of the globe can taste all aspects of Quebec life. <laughs> the maple syrup is very, very sweet. Something like water with sugar or like a, I don't know, like a coconut or something. But very, very different. Discovering that maple syrup actually comes from a tree and not a factory came as a pleasant surprise to most of the students. Maple sap begins to run in spring. Drop by drop it is collected. Some say it is the lifeblood of the tree. The students wanted to know how it gets from the tree to your table. To make one liter of maple syrup. Unfortunately, you don't collect maple syrup directly from the tree. Would be too nice, as Fernand was saying. No, you have to boil the water. Quebec is the world's largest producer of maple syrup. Some students were soon sampling another kind of amber liquid. At dinner, there was some confusion about what to do with the pork wines. And what do you think about the ear But the maple syrup went on everything. Bon appétit, les amis. After dinner, confusion reigned on the dance floor as the group tried to get their feet around traditional Quebec dance steps. And of course the day wouldn't have been complete without a taste of maple taffy on snow. And on cue, it even started snowing again. It's snow with syrup. Now I feel like a real Quebecer. Then it was time for one last dance. For those who could tear themselves away from the taffy, that is. This is Murphy Cobbing for Concordia Today. Well, Murphy, looks like you had a wonderful time. I did. It's certainly an evening I won't forget in a hurry. But I think we've all seen a different side of Concordia while we've been making this program. So that's our show for today. You can join us next week when we'll be back in studio at Concordia Today. And on behalf of all the graduates from the journalism department, thank you for watching. Bye! Bye.